is a lot. I just wanted to, on behalf of my family, say thank you for having us here this evening for this celebration. People ask us all the time, what was it like growing up with Jim Valvano? And Leanne and I could tell you so many stories and memories of her running across the court, Reynolds Coliseum, hugging my dad before games. But what we learned very early in our childhood was that there was the, oh gosh, the agony of defeat was tough in our house. I mean, if we had a victory, if there was a W, you could ask my dad for anything. I mean, can I go on a trip to Cancun with a bunch of girls? Sure, no problem. Sign this bad report card or test. Absolutely. It was a party at the Valvano house when we won. But if we lost, my dad was quite emotional. I know that's a shocker. You did not even look at him. You had head down. I mean, if you passed him in the hallway, you just held your breath. I mean, you really had to just make sure that you avoided him at all costs because he took losses so hard. And so we were so trained that we knew what to do in our house when my dad was coaching. It was a roller coaster, but we loved watching my dad on the sidelines and how passionate he was about sports and how much joy he got from being in Reynolds Coliseum. Even when he left coaching and he went to ESPN, we were able to see him flourish. And he was just a natural in the studio. I would, we would go and watch him with John Saunders and everybody at ESPN. And that was his second home. And he was so thankful to be there. And things got a little bit calmer in our house. He would start taking Leanne to school and come to our school events. And there weren't as many ups and downs as we had experienced when he was coaching. And, you know, to us, we looked at my dad as if he was our hero. He could do anything. And so imagine just a short time after starting working at ESPN, we learned that my dad had terminal cancer. And I remember being in the room with the doctor at the time. He was a stranger to us. We hadn't started therapy yet or any of his treatment. And that stranger in that white lab coat informed my Superman that he had met his kryptonite in the form of adenocarcinoma. And I remember that doctor saying to my dad, you have a 1% chance of living past a year. And I told you how my dad acted after tough losses. So I couldn't imagine as we left the hospital what he was going to do, the emotion that was going to come out of him. And I remember he took the car keys from my mom they got behind the wheel and we drove home in silence. I was sitting in the back seat and I could see his eyes in the rearview mirror and I had seen that look before. I could almost hear the wheels turning. I'm not gonna tell you that the last 10 months of his life weren't a challenge and weren't heartbreaking because they were, but they were also filled with so much humor and hope. Almost immediately, I remember seeing my dad take out a yellow pad, and he wrote down what he wanted to do. He wanted to start a golf tournament that would raise money for cancer research. And he wanted to ask anyone that would listen. I mean, the guy who delivered the newspaper in the morning, you want to be on my team. Because he knew that when a team is united under one vision, they can accomplish what we cannot do alone. And so he talked to anyone, hey, we would have as a family liked to have just gone home and dealt with this quietly. But yet my dad had other plans. Even as his body weakened, his spirit seemed to take flight. And he just asked everyone, please help me fund cancer research. I remember him being in the hospital and meeting with a young researcher and we'd found out that he had a protein in his cells that was resistant to the treatment. And so that young researcher said, let's try this. And this was months before he passed away. And he said, absolutely. And I remember him saying, you see that young guy? He's the underdog. And that's who I want to fund. And so he started asking people, will you be on the board of directors? And ESPN came to him and said, we want to announce the establishment of the V Foundation at the inaugural ESPYs. What most people don't know, though, is that my dad had trouble walking at that point. And we thought, how are we going to get to New York and actually be at the ESPY Awards? Well, somehow we made it there. He wasn't going to be stopped. And we got to the actual theater. And then I noticed, if you guys have seen it, there was a steep just steps that were going right up to the podium. And I thought, how is he even going to get to the top? Because he could barely walk. And yet I forgot that he had teammates that were there. 
And so Dick Vitale and Mike Krzyzewski, it was such a beautiful moment of them helping him to the podium. And he didn't have a note card, guys. He had not planned anything that he was going to say. So we kind of just sat there holding our breath. And my dad, every moment that he had lived had led to that time, that speech. And he poured out his essence on everyone that was listening about how important sports was to him, how much joy he had gotten from all of those victories, even though some of those defeats. But then he also became vulnerable and talked to us about what it was like dealing with terminal cancer. And he said, we're starting the V Foundation for Cancer Research. It may not save my life. It may save my children's lives. It may save someone you love. And then there was this moment that most of you don't know about. He came back down and he sat down next to me and my mom and he leaned over and he whispered, did I do okay? <laughs> and you know, my dad had a big ego. He didn't really ask us most of the time if he did okay, because he knew he had done okay. But in that moment, that was how special it was to him that he wanted to know he had said the right things to encourage all of us, to give us hope, because he knew what it was like for all of those cancer patients that he had met along the journey. A few short weeks after that, we would have to say goodbye to my dad, but immediately we went into using his legacy and his words to start the V Foundation. Now I laugh because at times through the years, my sisters and I all worked at the V Foundation and there was a time when I would have to call the CEO and say, can I go to Staples and get some copy paper? Because we're, we're out, we don't have any. And now I look at this and I cannot believe where we are. We talk about victory over cancer, but I have to tell you, it's not something that is going to come we are already experiencing it. 13 years after my father passed away, I was 33 years old, sitting in bed one night, and I noticed that I had a lump in my right breast. I thought, wow, you know, what am I gonna do? And so I immediately called the person that has taken care of our family for so many years, Dr. Joe Moore, and he got me in for more testing. And another stranger in a lab coat informed me that I not only had breast cancer, but I had inherited a genetic mutation from my dad that made me more susceptible to many other forms of the disease. Armed with this knowledge, my doctors were able to create a course of treatment. Now, I want you to realize that we didn't know my dad had this gene because it had not been discovered. It was only through cancer research that they discovered this mutation and they knew that I had inherited it from my dad. And I sat before the head of genetic breast cancer research at Duke as we went about planning my treatment. I wish I could tell you that I fought like my dad, but I really don't want to lie since my sister's here. She'd be like, nope, that's not true. People would come up to me and say, don't give up, don't ever give up, and I would want to punch them in the face because I was like, dude, I am not my dad. I'm not Jim Valvano, and I don't have a vision. I don't have a united team. I don't know what it's going to be like to survive. And so this moment came where I was sitting at the kitchen table holding my bald head in my hands, and I decided I was going to give up. I said, this is too hard. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I don't think I can do this. Even though my doctors had assured me that we had caught my cancer early and I was going to be okay, the one person that I needed there to cheer me up and to give me hope was my dad, and he wasn't there. As I sat there with my eyes closed, I could hear my dad's voice in my head, we're starting the V Foundation for Cancer Research. It may not save my life, it may save my children's lives, it may save someone you love. I knew that speech. I had heard it a million times. I worked at the V Foundation, I could recite it, but I never knew that prophetically my dad had spoken those words, not only over all of you, but he had spoken them to me. You see, I was the someone that my dad loved. I was the person that could now walk in his footsteps and the legacy that he created and my ending could be different. And so in that moment, I decided I wasn't gonna give up and I was gonna survive. In August, I will celebrate being an 18-year cancer survivor. And a day does not go by that I don't thank my dad for the words that he gave all of us, that I don't think about the work that's being done at the V Foundation. When I drive my kids to carpool or when I see my son graduate from college, I know that I can rest 
because I know the V Foundation is, is funding quality cancer research and I know my dad has left a game plan so that we can have a W. I know that if he was here, he would be cracking jokes. He would be running around the room looking for all of you to hug. And so I just want to thank you for being here. Not only as a daughter am I proud of the work that's being done at the V Foundation, but as a cancer survivor, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing that saves lives. I am alive today because of cancer research, make no mistake. And the money that we are raising is going to continue to save lives. The last thing I just want to say is, Dad, I think you did more than okay. Thank you.